Um, really the goal of this series is, we all know your digital presence is important. Digital marketing is so, so important. However, today is the foundation. It is the building block. You do not want to be spending time on digital marketing or including social media if your website is not ready for it. So I'm so glad you all are here today. This is your foundation. Um, and so we're gonna walk you, you through a lot of tips that's gonna allow you to go back and look at your site and ask how is that working for you. Um, and Gina and I really love interaction from uh, participants. So we're gonna, we're gonna trade back and forth as we go through this, um, but we would love for you to participate with questions in the chat, um, questions that you might have as we go through. So today is the foundation on the website, then we're gonna get into some digital marketing basics, and then we're gonna push you a little bit beyond into some advanced digital marketing in the last module that we do. So I really love, again, that people can collaborate. So if you want to put your name, your organization, and what you're responsible for in the chat box, that just gives us a little bit of insight so we can perhaps tailor some of our content or give examples that might be helpful for you and just add questions into that. So the objectives for today is how to determine the objectives for your website because you need to decide what is your website supposed to do? You have to ask that question. Determine how your navigation will work and how to create a site map. We'll go through that. Create a home page for your users to have a great user experience. Um, give an overview on a few tips for accessibility. And then also talk about curating content to update your site because you don't just create your website and let it sit there. You need to be consistently updating your content on your website. So, uh, Gina, I'll do this first one, and then I'll and then I'll kick it over to you. Um, so, what is your website's core purpose? This is different for every organization. So, we have a couple of samples in here. We've got some nonprofit samples. We've got some business samples. So, are you sharing content and resources? Do you have direct services that you want to sell? Is it engagement? Um, what is the purpose of your website? Um, is if you are B2B, it might be to get the call, to get the meeting. Um, if you are B2C, maybe it's to close a purchase. So to really think about what that is and take some time and write those down and then rank them in order of importance and then focus on the top two or three items because you, your website can't do everything. You really have to rank in order of importance as to what your web, you want your website to do. So in writing those things down and ranking them, what does your website do specifically to help achieve those objectives? So are you a nonprofit? Are you sharing your mission and collecting donations? Are you a service business um, that's looking for people to sign up to gain your contact information? Are you demonstrating your results and effectiveness, asking for visitors to be a meaningful part of your solution? So is, are there strong calls to action on your site? Um, are you offering a password protected portal for your users? All of the objectives need to then be fleshed out in what you're doing on the site. If you wanna collect more emails, you need a place for people to sign up for newsletters, premium content, whatever. If you want them to donate, that needs to be obvious that they are there to donate and support your cause. So think about what your objectives are and then what are you doing to help achieve those objectives? Next one. Um, so how do the objectives and goals intersect to create experiences that delight users? You want your audience to be impacted by your site. They want to be engaged. They want to do things for you. Some of the ways you can get people engaged is to show testimonials. Um, I always say, if you can get somebody to cry, you can get somebody to write a check. So, you know, tell those emotional stories that are going to impact people and make sure that they resonate with your audience. You know, pictures, it, they speak a thousand words. We've, everybody has said it for years. Nobody wants to read 10,000 words. They want to see who you are, what you do, where you do it, and how you do it, and how can they engage. If you're event-driven, you know, the Baltimore Business Journal, they've got a calendar of events on their website that people can go and see what's going on. 
not only in their organization, but other business organizations in the area. Um, are you providing resources? So I've got a client that's a disabilities attorney and she's got all of her forms for Social Security Administration on the website so that people can go and grab those forms and have them ready before she meets. Um, so that's great. That makes their life easier. Yep. hundred percent. And so, you know, ultimately you want your website to be a tool for your user rather than something that focuses inward on the organization. You want to focus outward on the people you're touching. Next Absolutely. Slide. And I like what you said, Gina, too. I think talking about so there's two ways you can communicate what you do, right? You can be very tactical. You can share a lot of statistics, but those testimonials start to show story and heart. And we, we're not talking about brand messaging today, but when you think about your organization, you want to know who you are, what you do, and why you matter, right? So that is like Gina said, you want to tug on the heartstrings. You want to tell a story about what you do. You don't just want to have data. And they work really, really well together testimonials are almost like a shortcut to sharing that story. Right. And, you know, you'll find me telling a lot of stories today because I feel that's more impactful than you reading a PowerPoint. So, you know, you will hear a lot of stories and I think that that should transcend to your website. So how does your website make your overall work easier? Number one, you know, if you're if somebody's donating, you don't have to ask for a donation directly. They can go directly to your website, and it, it's obvious they can donate it. Um, you can create a funnel so that people can easily find your services. You can have form submissions. You can have newsletter signups. You can have premium content signups. You can create. Once these people sign up, then they can get put into a, a email marketing campaign or marketing automation. So your website should be your primary. They used to say, I used to tell yellow pages back in the day, and it was your front door, your telephone, the yellow pages. Well, now it's your front door, the telephone, your salespeople, and your website. That should be one of your sales tools and teams. Absolutely. And, and when you think about it, you can think about how can you almost think in terms if your website was an employee, right? So similar to what Gina said, her client that has all of the forms somebody needs to bring to their first meeting. Great. That's already on the website. It doesn't require an assistant to download those forms, attach them in an email and email to them. Your contact form, if you've got multiple people, if you've got multiple services, if you're a nonprofit and you have multiple programs, your contact form, you can program to send it to the right person rather than just one person in the office at the info address and going through and funneling that out to other people. So there's a lot of efficiencies you can actually bring into your organization. And I saw a couple people in the chat here. We've got a courier here. So, I mean, that's huge for people looking up where you deliver to different things like that. We've got Jessica. So she's got a trout, she has a travel um, business advisory business. And so she has already on her new website, I've had a sneak peek, of where you can book time to talk with her, right? So if somebody, if you have somebody's interest right there, boom, they can click on that link and they can go ahead and schedule it rather than writing down, oh, I have to call Jessica later to look at my calendar to find a time. So to think about those ways that you can um, add some efficiencies. One of the cool things that we've got on our website, and I'll get to the slide, but just to, to add on to that, is we've got a chatbot feature on our website. And while ours is very simple, you can add those efficiencies by creating scripts that answer the frequently asked questions. Hi, this is, okay, who am I speaking with? What's my phone number? What's my email? How can I help you? And then once they say their problem is they need a website, then I can funnel them to a whole series of other questions that they can answer. So by the time I get it, we're not trying to figure out what they need. I already know what they need. So chatbot is really becoming a huge thing to try and maximize those efficiencies. Um, is your, your website responsive? That means, is it gonna resolve on a telephone, an iPad, a computer screen, or a big screen? If your 
if your existing website isn't responsive, it's time for a new website. And if you're spending the time to build a responsive website or a website, you better make it responsive. Currently, Google is placing its primary ranking factor on the mobile experience. Google almost doesn't care what a desktop experience is anymore. So if you don't have a mobile responsive site, you are being penalized by Google, which means you're showing up lower in the search engine results page when people search for your product or service. Yes, and, and one of the tricks you can do is you can just move your browser window and resize your browser window if your content on your website resizes within that, your site is responsive, which just means the content is re-displaying based upon the size it has to, to do. And I almost, we've had this slide in here for probably five years. Google has been saying, hey, responsive is important. Hey, mobile is important. And now it's hit the point where Gina says, the mobile experience is first on Google. So that's why I still think it's important to touch base in here because I still come across websites that are not responsive. Um, and that's where you're having to resize the text on your phone to go ahead and, and take a look at things. If you don't so, want to do the, oops, sorry, Rebecca. If you don't want to do the resizing that Rebecca just said, you can go to Google and type into Google, is my website responsive? And it will pull up the Google responsive test. You put your URL in there and it comes up green or red. It's super simple. That's awesome. I love that. Um, so next we're going to talk about user experience and that really is talking about the sitemap and talking about the wireframe. So similar to what Gina said, your website is not about you. It is about people that are coming to your site. They have a problem. They need you for something, right? So we want to drive that engagement. Typically, if you can think about who your audience is, what are they typically coming to your site to look for? Make sure that is extremely obvious when they get to your page. So think about, um, you can think about the sitemap and the homepage or, or wireframe are very different. The sitemap is, looks like an org map, and we're gonna take a look at it in a minute, but basically that's all the content you have organized on your site. Your homepage is for the user to engage in to get into exactly what they need for you. So you don't wanna think about the homepage, putting all of your content and everything you do on the homepage. You wanna think about what are those questions that people are coming to your website for and how can you immediately answer them very, very quickly. So looking at the sitemap, this is a great way to take a look at it. So on the left here, we have what we call a wireframe. And on the right side, we have what we call a sitemap. What I love about this is you can go ahead and map out what your current site looks like. You could create a site map on this. We use a tool called Slick Plan, which it's really great to create it. Um, but if your site is hopefully on um, a, a CRM, you know, hopefully WordPress, you can go ahead and change your site map, right? Your organization is going to change over time. So it's really helpful to sit down and go, what exactly do we want on our site? What makes sense? The other reason I love a site map is it's also what doesn't belong on our site, right? It wasn't too long ago, maybe eight or so years ago, eight to 10 years ago, we had scrolling pages and pages of long form content, right? When websites were first out, it was long, 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 long content. Now that doesn't make sense. People wanna go get a little bit of an information and then they wanna act. So your site map can help you determine what belongs on the site, how do you organize it, and what content doesn't necessarily belong on a site. Sometimes we'll have people within an organization that want to share, you know, 2,000 words that they put in a grant proposal, um, or they, or they want to use a lot of, you know, high-level industry words, or um, that is not necessarily going to appeal to people. However, you can take a look at and go, this might not belong in the main section of our website, but is this blog content? Is this news content? So I think that's something that's really, really helpful when you do it. And again, um, we like the tool Slick Plan, but you can also just sketch it out on a, on a sheet of paper. So when you look, you wanna start when you're planning your sitemap, what should be on the navigation bar? Um, you, I would say max seven, I would really say, I would really say try to stick to five, right? You don't need to have so many. If you're in an internal agreement, maybe you can nudge up to seven, 
never ever go over seven, right? So you can see here on our Red Start site, um, currently we've got six. Um, we've got six in our navigation and really this one right here is kind of a is a is a contact form button. So it says get started and that actually takes you to our contact forms. Similar to what Gina says, she has her chat bot, we have our contact forms and people can fill out, um, I'm looking for X, Y, Z, and it's a series of questions and that will come over to us. But if you've got too many items up there, people are like, they get confused about where to find the information that they're looking for. Um, Google doesn't love it and people will get annoyed. They'll be like, whoa, that's a lot of content. I just wanna get to really what, what I need to do. Um, so again, here's a blown up version of the sitemap. So again, Ours, we have values, what we do, results, culture, learning, and get started. So everything we do is underneath these. Um, and then you'll see in our, in our wireframe, we also highlight those things that people are most interested in. Um, so you can talk about what are our top headers and then how are we gonna put the, the information um, in there? Oops, sorry. There, there we go. So when you're organizing the sitemap, look at your, the primary pages are going to be your homepage, your about us page, and the products and services page. When I use that homepage, I should be able to figure out what you do immediately. It should, I should not have to look around to try and figure it out. Both visually and in verbiage, be really careful with the stuff you write on your website. Don't make it jargony. Don't, you know the robust platform for engagement, blah, blah, blah. Tell people what the hell you do. Tell them who you are on that about page. Believe it or not, Google tends to rank about us pages quicker than they do home pages because you can really put the content, who you are, what you believe, who, what the personality of the company is. And I should be able to look at that and go, that looks like a company that I want to do business with. And then the products and services page is where pages are where you should spend a lot of time in content development, but make it easy to read. You want to tell people everything you do and what it is that you do within that thing. It also helps with search engine optimization. It used to be able, you used to be able to do, if you were an HVAC contractor, you could put heating, ventilation, and air conditioning on one page. Now you really need a page for each one in order to index appropriately in Google. So think about breaking out your services with as much information as possible. Yes, and one thing to point out here, and it was in the wireframe as well, but most sites, right, you've got this great big image up here. You know, imagery is so, so important. You've got funnels here for different audiences. You can do whatever, but this area here, right below this graphic, this is the most viewed area on a website. This area here in your footer, I'm gonna go back really quick just to this wireframe, just to say, and I think we might do it further in, in the presentation, but right below your big image, this area here, so that's why most sites you go to give you these quick buttons to click on and then the footer. So that's what people are looking for. And, and to what Gina said, look at this right here about the campaign. This is two or three sentences. This is not six paragraphs, right? I can look, I can scroll down, I can see this is what you're about. And here are the areas most likely I'm going to need to click on. So, oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, when when developing a home page, pull together that that wireframe so that you can see exactly what's happening. Here's your big hero image. Rebecca calls them funnels. We call them buckets of information. And then any, you know, conversation about what it is and then calls to action and then reinforce everything in the footer. So you need to have this before you can even go to the design phase. Next one. It, again, we, we talked about the calls to action, donate, schedule a tour, calendar of events, careers, and then that big hero image at the top. Now, I do not recommend scrolls, scrolling sliders anymore because they, they 
slow websites down upon load and Google, one of their biggest ranking factors besides mobile is the, is the um, load speed of the website. So we will do a slider in a desktop, but we will limit it to a single image, hero image, if we even have a hero image in the mobile so that we've got maximum load speed. And then Absolutely. the footer, you wanna reinforce everything that's above the fold. That's your index. That's you know the, the table of contents, if you will. So all of these elements are really important to your homepage design and then get them into the meat of the content. Absolutely, and make it easier, easy for them to get there. Um, Peter chimed in in the chat and he said he's working on a personal website um, and he had a question. He said, can, um, can I develop it in Wix and Squarespace? And so what I tell people is everything you do in marketing, right, has a, has a spectrum, right? You could spend $50, $500 or $5,000, right? There is a solution at every point. Um, if you are starting out and if you have a low budget, I think you can certainly look at, I would, I would recommend Squarespace over Wix because I've seen, and Gina, you can chime in, I've seen some responsive issues with Wix websites that even technically they say are responsive, they don't tend to function really well. With Squarespace, they'll do the hosting for you. Um, they've got some gorgeous templates um, in there that you can use. So if you're doing a solution other than WordPress or you know a larger CRM, I typically will recommend Squarespace. I, I agree. I think there's a lot of limitations on the SEO part of Wix. There's very little you can do to engage with Google. And at the end of the day, you can have the most beautiful site in the world, but if it can't be found in a Google search, you might as well not have one at all. So Absolutely. I would agree with Rebecca in that you can start with Wix or with Squarespace. Yes. And when you're building a site on WordPress, if you're planning it out right, for example, I'm talking to a potential client on Friday and it's funny, they keep saying beta site, beta site. I was like, it's not a beta site. This is your website. If you build it in WordPress, as you grow, guess what? You can add pages, you can change pages, you can rearrange your pages. We have a client that is going into their sixth year on a WordPress site. They, every three years, they do a design or a style update, right? So we're doing our second one now, but that's great. They used to say the average lifespan for websites were three to five years. I think it's increasing specifically due to WordPress because the platform is always updating as long as you're maintaining it and keeping it up to date is great. And I think that's another reason, Gina, that if you are a startup, you know, if you don't have a lot of people to monitor things, Squarespace handles the hosting and the maintenance for you. Um, and they have gotten better. Squarespace still is not as good as SEO as WordPress. They yeah. are better than they used to be, and they are much better than Wix or GoDaddy or anything else. Oh, we have a question. What about building it in Google? I have never done it. I've never had a client do it, and I know very little about it. Yeah. Um, somebody said, what about a hoster? Um, blue is not, oh, blue is not good. So who else? Oh, so who would you recommend for, uh, so I think if the question is, uh, what would you recommend for hosting? So for hosting, there's a lot of hosts out there, but here's what I will tell you. Hosting is a specific skill set. You need to have people that understand how to host, to understand the servers. For us, we outsource our hosting to a partner. So we refer everybody to a local partner um, called Foxtrot. Gina, do you guys do your hosting all within your company and you have a partner you work with? No, we do all of our own hosting and maintaining okay. servers. We use Bluehost. Okay. There's Dreamhost. There's, I mean, there's a million of them out there. They're all basically the same. Um, a lot of people are getting into Amazon hosting. I think a lot of it depends on what, how deep your pockets are, because you can, you know, Bluehost for me, I spend couple of grand a year. Um, WP Engine was that much a month. So you just have to look at it. Somebody had a question about Shopify. I love Shopify, but it is expensive. It is, it is a great site if you are in a retail environment, but it is very expensive between the fees and the credit card processing and all of that. 
we steer our clients unless they very specifically need to be on Shopify. We move everything into WooCommerce, which which combines with WordPress to make a seamless shopping cart environment. That's what we recommend as well. We recommend WooCommerce too. Yep. Look at us agreeing on all the things. I love yeah. it. It's a, it's, a, it's a reason we're here today. <laughs> so, um, just to wrap up the homepage, your homepage is your salesperson for your business. So it has to serve your audiences and answer questions. Who are you? What do you do? How do you do it? Be very simple in getting that information out. Don't get crazy with fonts and flying things and moving bars and scrolling crap. I once had a guy ask me if he could have a Tarzan swinging in off the website. And I was like, <laughs> sure, that you can, but I won't do that. So it, this is definitely part of the Keep It Simple Stupid program. Tell people who you are, what you do, and how you do it, and move on. Yes, I, I say that all the time. Um, I'm sure everybody here remembers, but you know, like late nineties, early two thousands, when web designers all of a sudden were like, oh my gosh, look what I could do. There were flash animations. There was music. There was all this stuff that distracted you from what they were really about. And full disclosure, I was a print designer at the time. And I was like, I hate websites. <laughs> Because I felt like it was so hard to get to the information that you really wanted. And I honestly think so much of that design was just designers' egos wanting to do cool stuff. What I love about web design right now and web development is in large part due to WordPress because it is simple. It is clear. If you look at this layout here, you can see you're using colors to divide things. There's also something in this layout, right? You've got a picture and you have content, right? But these are all done as blocks. So it's very easy to stack when you do it. You've got a very light color down here, which is telling your eye, this content goes together and I'm moving on to another one. So really think about what that looks like. And I think we have another sample here. Again, pay attention to your fonts and your colors, make sure you're within your brand but really look at how color can define areas of content and make it simple. Again, look at here, the funnels or the buckets. This is really, really easy for you to see. This is a beautiful site that we did for TasteWise Kids. It's an awesome organization um, that does food education to children in schools. And we had so much fun designing icons and fun things for them, but have beautiful images, have colors, have it be within your brand. And again, this fits the playful tone, right? They are working with children. So you've got a lot of really fun, bright colors in there. So really think about your design um, as you are going through the process. Um, so we've kind of talked about your user experience. We've talked about bringing people in. We've talked about the sales thing. So let's say you've done the most amazing site ever and you're super excited about it. Guess what? you have to keep doing things to your site. You can't just say, boom, we're done our website. It's ready to go. Google loves sites that has consistently updated content. And when we talk to people, sometimes they're really tired, right? After developing their website and they want to think about that. So a couple of things to think about. How are you adding new content to your website? What type of content will be considered? Who in your organization is going to review that content and say, this is okay to go on the website? So it's really important as you're finishing your website, determining what are the guidelines for new content? And then also what will it be? So you wanna kind of write that up. You wanna have a time component. You might wanna look at an editorial calendar to look at here's what we'll add each month. Having a blog or a news section, really, really easy way to keep your content fresh where you can do, you know, one or two pieces of content a month, or you could do one or two pieces of content a week. I would say you at least should be posting a new piece of content twice a month. Um, if you can do more, absolutely do more. And one thing to think about is when your site is done, you don't want to think about refreshing your content and the whole site every year, right? So a great way to do it is to go back to your site map and say, in January, we are gonna review the homepage and make any content tweaks there. 
in February, we're gonna review the About Us page and so on and so forth. You can always do them on the fly, right? Oh, quick, we've gotta add that product, we've gotta add that service. But looking at the content you have written, looking at, hey, we're gonna look at each section of the site in a month over the year, breaks it down and it's not as overwhelming. And then Google sees you're updating your content in addition to just doing blogs. So that's really, really important. When you're coming up for content, right, that new content, you can write it from scratch, but you can also curate it from other sources, right? So you can post a link to other articles. You can do 200 words of commentary to provide context. And that shows, oh, hey, they're paying attention. Like, so when we do this, for example, we looked at a bunch of different resources around direct mail fundraisers for nonprofits. So we went through and we read that article and we said, hey, check out this article. Look at all these great highlights. Here's some things you should think about. Um, you can also ask for guest post articles. Don't spam people with requests for guest posts. Make sure those are people that you know. Um, because I think that's really very important. And you could reach out. If you read a, read a great article, you could say, wow, I read your article. I really like it. Would you be interested in writing something that we can share with our audience? Um, the other, oh, go ahead. Look, I just want to jump in on two things real quick. Um, when you're developing content and you're sharing content, two things to keep in mind. Number one, you want to, in air quotes, eat your content. Your content should show your expertise, your authority, and your trustworthiness. That is ultimately the content that is going to get indexed in Google. So make sure you keep those three things in mind. Also around repurposing other people's content, you cannot just take an article, copy and paste it into your website. You will get penalized by Google for yeah. duplicate content. So you have to have those 100 or 200 words, and then a link to the other person's article. I promise you, if you copy and paste other people's content, you are doing nothing more than harming yourself. So yes. expertise, authority, trustworthiness, no taking other people's content and using it improperly. Yes, yes. And Peter asked, is there a professional body for web designers? Um, there is not a professional like web designers association that I'm aware of. There is AIGA, but that's graphic artists. I'm going to tell you a great way. I'm going to give BBB. I'm going to give you a little plug. Go to your BBB and see who they vetted, right? N not just anybody can be a member of the BBB. They have to be vetted. They have to make sure there's no outstanding complaints on them. I can tell you, and I'm Gina, I know you've done this too. Typically every year we will get three new clients from people that have worked with a web developer that has either disappeared, done yep. a poor job or not finished the site. Yep. So when you are looking for a web designer, look at your network, check references, have a conversation with them. I say this about any communication professional you're going to work with. There's a lot of us out there. There's personality fits, right? Make sure you're going to get along with the person. Make sure they have experience in the area of what you're doing. Go ahead and talk to them and have those conversations and make sure you're checking references. I think you can also go to the AMA, American Marketing Association. There's, okay. there, locally, there's a greater Baltimore chap chapter. Um, not every web developer is a member of AMA, but there are quite a few. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing on content, so one, you can brainstorm and write your own content. That's number one. Number two, you can give your feedback on something somebody else has written, give them credit, link out to it, do not copy their words. Three, you can look at what's internal, what's some internal content that you've written. So it might depend, is there um, content you've written for a presentation? So I know I'm doing a lot of presentations all the time. Um, I go ahead and we'll look at our presentations and we'll pull information out of that and we'll write blog articles that way. Um, are there things you're putting in proposals? Are there things you're writing internally? Um, there's, there's probably existing content within your organization that you can take and you can build upon. Um, that's the same thing with employee, employee content. If people are writing content for different things, you can go ahead and 
look at that. We're gonna, Gina's gonna do just a brief little bit about accessibility, whether or not you have requirements, it's really important to keep in mind. Yeah, so I don't have any good answers here, but what I can tell you is that there are people going around now and finding websites that are not ADA acceptable and people are getting sued. The flip side to that conversation is to have a fully ADA compliant website is number one, nearly impossible. Number two, 10 times the cost of developing a regular website. So you've got to, you've got to have your risk versus reward. There are tools that Rebecca's got listed here that show all the standards. If you are in WordPress, there is an accessibility plugin that will call out problems on your website. Things like fonts, font size, lightness, darkness, you're never going to have the budget to do everything that is W3C accessible, but at least do the minimums so that people using cart readers, site challenged, hearing challenged folks have the opportunity to read your website. Put your alt tags on the site. Make sure you, you know, flag and tag everything. Um, there you go. Add, add video add hyperlinks so people can read more, but understand you are never gonna be 100% compliant unless you've got a $100,000 budget for your website. Yes, I'm glad you said that, Gina. And, and typically what we do for all of our sites, not just ones where there's a requirement, is we check things such as contrast, right? Because contrast is a big one. If you don't yeah. have enough contrast, it's really hard to read and making sure you're doing your alt tags on your site. Like that's a huge thing that takes a little bit of work, but that's work that you can do after the fact, right? Your site is done. You can go on each image. You can go ahead and add these different things in there. Um, and that's really important. Also, Google will be really happy if you have your alt tags. So that's you, I think you see a theme of us kind of talking a lot about Google. Google basically is saying, look, we want you to have the best quality website you can have so people get what you're talking about. Um, yep. And that is things responsive, alt tags, um, updating, ex you know, frequently updating content. Those are all of those things and that's why they're so very important. Melody, an alt tag is attached to an image on your website that when you hover over it or that so when somebody's using a reader, can understand what that image is. It literally flags and tags the image to explain what people that are able to see can see in the image. Right, so you can see right here, the title of the image is Mock Party. Alt text is young girl, I think it says young girl and her mother. Then there's a longer description. So all of your photos on your website, you can actually go in and fill out this information. So somebody that's visually impaired might scroll over the image and it will tell them what the image looks like. And it is a time, it's a time consuming process, but it's well worth it to do so. Genevieve, in the, in WordPress, in the image gallery, there's that box that Rebecca showed where you can add in the alt tag information. On Wix and Squarespace, they have similar functionality, but it's not as good as WordPress. Yes, I realize I sound like a broken record. Um, <laughs> the other thing that I, I just want to point out to Rebecca is when we talked before about audience, understand that your website is going to be a little schizophrenic in that your audience is your primary customer, but your audience is also Google. And it really, really, really matters because again, like I said, you could have a beautiful site that you know people would love to react with, but if they can't find it, you might as well not have it. So you've got to look at both audiences when designing a website. Yep, yep. So just a couple of different notes, speaking of WordPress, um, images that work well on WordPress. So number one, I'm gonna say have good quality photographs. I feel like in this day and age, there's really no excuse to have poor grainy photographs on your site. Um, there are so many sites out there. There's iStock, which can be a little bit general, but low cost royalty photos. So you can use them um, on things. But there's also really cool other sites that have 
more specific audiences. There's a site, it's called Death to Stock Photography. So they try to make their pictures a little more innovative and a little less posed. There are stock photography sites for different um, types of audiences, right? That you might need to have. There might be stock, uh, stock photo sites that are good for LGBTQ. There might be stock photography sites that are more diverse. iStock is low cost. It can be a little boring, but you can get some images out of there. So make sure you're getting good images on there and make sure you're saving them well and make sure you're saving them not as giant files. Because if you have a giant photo, you want to make sure you're saving it as a, as a lower res photo. And JPEG really is the best for photographs. Um, if you want to use a PNG file, you can use that for photographs and line art. So if you've got like something that is not a photograph that could work really well as that. So that's just a little bit of a note on make sure your photo um, quality is good. Make sure you're using that. Uh, the more creative image site. Gina, what are one that there's one it's it's literally called death to stock photography. Um, like unsplash for creativity. Um, Shutterstock. I, I just want to make a point about images, use licensed images or use images that are purposefully unlicensed like Unsplash. If you just go and grab an image from the web, you will get an email from Getty Images that says you owe me $3,000. The other thing is when you are buying images, make sure you read what you're buying them for. So for example, there are there's one repository, you can buy an image, you can use it on the website, but if you change your website, you redo your website, you got to rebuy the image. If you buy the image for your website, you can't use it on your print collateral. So be very, very familiar with what your license is and don't just go grabbing random images because you, I promise you, you will get that letter and you will have to pay. Absolutely. Yeah, Clay's given a giant thumbs up to that one. Um, and here's what I will tell you. Um, it's so easy to get good images now that are ro royalty free means once you buy them, you can use it as much as you need to. So you can use it on your website, you can use it on print materials, you could use all of that. However, um, back when I was first a designer, there, th there was barely the internet, right? So you could not just download photos from that, we had to buy stock photography CDs from Getty Images. And so we had to like beg our boss saying, hey, we think we can use a couple of these. And like the, the discs themselves were like six or $800. Now there were a lot of images on there, but it might be one theme, right? It might be like, I don't know, road travel in the Midwest or um, I don't know, business or different things like that. And it was very, very limiting. And then you would have to go through these images. You'd have to take out the little books and you'd have to flip through every page rather than using search terms. So um, we really have it good right now as far as accessibility to high quality, low cost, royalty free images. Okay, so I think we're we're at the end of our content. This is a page of references. This is kind of where we got a lot of the content from. I always think always always reference your source content. Um, so there's a lot of great stuff in there. If you want to go in a little bit more, um, you know, want to dig it a little bit more to that. But I want to see if we have um, any questions. And I think we have some more popping up in the sidebar. I'm going to try to move my chat over a little bit so I can see it. Okay, can you put in was, the chat? The yeah, references? I was. I can. I can chime in on this one. We can actually provide these uh, slides if you guys are comfortable with it. Instead of copy pasting each one of those references in this chat box, we can just provide that in the follow up email that we'll send to you guys upon the conclusion of the presentation. Yes, that that would be great. Um, and it has all of our contact info. I think some of you had specific questions for us in the chat. So you know, Gina and I are obviously not not shy and love to chat about this stuff. So you can feel free to reach out to either one of us. And I think this might actually be a good opportunity to talk about kind of 
some of our niches because even though Jean and I do something similar, our niches are a little bit different. So um, Red Start, we focus on nonprofits, educational, environmental, and family support services. And in the small business sector, we tend to focus on women-owned businesses and service-based businesses. So Gina, your your focus is a little is a little different and and a lot in, a lot more in the small business space. Yeah, we we primarily do business with small businesses to provide an affordable solution to enhancing your digital footprint. So you know we're not dealing with ten million dollar companies. We're dealing with you know a million dollar company under five typically, and um, I like to for. Those of us that are old enough in the room, I do a lot of business with Yellow Pages clients. So a lot of people that used to do a lot of Yellow Pages advertising don't have an outlet anymore. Those are the guys and gals that we can help. I have a question, but um, it'd be easier for me to ask it instead of typing it. How do you balance, um, you know, you're saying you, you want images, you don't want a lot of words. How do you balance that with like kind of, you know, telling your story? it's, you know, it's kind of hard to tell a story with a picture. Well, you want to do words and you want to make sure your homepage, it is, you need to have at least 250 words on your homepage for Google, right, Gina, 250 and yep. internals for at least 400. So you do want to have words and then sure. even to speak more, Gina, you can talk to it long form content. So you could do a short blog article that's 500. You can also do long form blog, blog articles that are 1500 words. Google eats that up. <laughs> well, I was yeah. thinking, you know, you're saying on your homepage, you want to start with the picture and have minimal text. And I'm just thinking like for my business, it'd be hard for me to tell my story without having a lot of text or. So that's where Melody, I would have a, a paragraph with a read more that leads to your about us page where you can be expansive on that. Okay. Gotcha. That, that's how Absolutely. I would. And I would, if you can have a bar for testimonials on your homepage, you know, I think further down towards the footer is a great place to do it. Oh my gosh, Gina, I love your story. <laughs> oh my God. It's such a good story. Um, so, briefly, the reason my company name is what it is, was when I got into the business, I didn't realize how crowded the space was and how many people had already taken names that would pass trademark. And a month into my business, I still didn't have a business name. And I might've had a martini or two, and I might've gotten up to use the ladies room. And I tripped over my dog who is black, but has non-specific alopecia, which means all you can see is skin. And I looked down and I saw her and I said, my God, that's the pinkest dog I've ever seen. And that's what stuck. I love it. I love it. And it's memorable, right? You have a story around it. Those of you that know the story around it will never forget the name of your business. Um, and my business is, is named, um, I have, it's hard to tell in Zoom. I have I had bright red hair most of my life. And I always had one sort of red nickname or another, any variation. Um, and so I wanted to uh, have that as part of the name. And the red start is actually a bird. So, and I also just felt like it was a really powerful, firm name. And also nobody can pronounce TAFE. So there was no way I was going to name the business like TAFE Creative because nobody would ever get that right. <laughs> what else do we have in questions? we got a couple more minutes. Thank you all for all the participation today. I mean... I love that. I hate that when I'm sitting and I'm talking, I'm like, anybody, does anybody have anything to share? So I really appreciate, um, I really appreciate the input there. And thank you, Clay and Joanne for the opportunity. We are both available, you know, hit us up on LinkedIn, call us, email us. We'd love to extend the conversation. Uh, we're both big supporters of BBB and um, are just here as a resource to all of you.